It might be the summer breeze, it might be the summer trees, but I'm feeling better now. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. On today's show, we take a look at a very controversial topic, the alkalinity and acidity of the body. Does acidity really lead to disease? Our expert guests will help us bust some of the myths surrounding this complex topic. Well, it's great to have you with us on Real Health. I'm Stacey Holland and thanks for watching. It's a hot topic that no one seems to agree on. In fact, some dismiss it as nonsense, but others believe that there is great merit in it. What makes it all the more confusing is that there's science to back up both sides of the argument. Well, according to the theory, it's in our best interest to make sure we eat more alkaline foods than acid foods so that we end up with an overall alkaline load. This will supposedly protect us from the diseases of modern civilization, whereas eating a diet with a net acid load will make us vulnerable to everything from cancer to osteoporosis. Well, to help answer that question and shed some light on this subject, we have professor and author Celine Bernstein from Zest for Life. Ian Craig is a nutritional therapist and exercise physiologist, as well as Deborah Stewart, director of Fulvic Health. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And as I mentioned, it's a controversial topic. Um, in fact, in researching for this episode, I found almost equal arguments on either end, you know. But I think it ended up coming down to the fact that perhaps it's our understanding of the mechanisms behind acidity and alkalinity. So in order to kick it off, I'm going to go to you, Professor Bernstein. Okay, lovely. You're Thank going to give us a 101. <laughs> okay, um, pH stands for potential of hydrogen. Yep. People um, really appreciate the value of their health only when disease sets in. That's true. And, and you know, the choices we make on a daily basis, I find definitely can contribute to the state of our health. Yeah. You know, we're eating uh, lots of unrefined foods, not checking our labels, uh, drinking lots of coffee, tea, and not getting down to basics as yeah. we should. Yeah. You know, a lot of people come up to me and say, well, you know, my dad had a heart disease, my mom died of, cancer, I'm going to get it. Yeah. They're referring to their genetic predisposition. Now, genetic predisposition does come into it. Uh, funny enough, research today tells us that our genes are not our destiny and we can change that. I love that. that, actually, because, yeah, it's hope, actually. It definitely is yeah. hope. Uh, and we have to look at what we're eating. I mean, most of the diseases today, your heart disease, diabetes, your fibromyalgia, your autoimmune diseases, yeah. cancer, I feel that they definitely thrive in an acid environment. Okay. Because people are eating so much of these processed foods, etc. And I feel what we have to do today is not just stick to total alkaline, we have to have a balance yeah. of acid and alkaline foods in our system. Yeah. Well, I think the important thing is, yes, it is a controversial subject yeah. and certainly does come with a lot of criticism. But I think you have to look back at what Hippocrates would have said, let food be thy medicine. Yeah. Um, and it's a very relevant um, and often quoted um, subject. I think in terms of alkalinity and acidity, there's a lot of valid reason to understand that this concept is recognized by many in the medicine world, health caregivers, and it certainly provides a tool. Now, when we talk about um, acidity and alkalinity, it's measured in increments between one and 14, and you've got a neutral balance of seven. Yeah. So from between one and seven, you're gonna be um, acidic. Mm. Between seven and 14, you're generally recognized as alkaline. Like the stomach, for example, has um, a low pH of 3.6, around there, 3.5, and that's because it needs to be that way in order to digest food. Then you've got um, your, your blood pH, which yeah. is very important, yeah. and that's where the center of balancing arises, and that's at your 7.35, as we all know. So your body constantly fights to have this alkalinity balance. Homeostasis. And yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, your, and your organs go through a lot of pressure to be able to maintain that. 
There's, yeah, I mean, the figures I know are 7.35 to 7.45 yeah, yeah. is yes. the range. It's a very, very tight range. Yeah. The body works really hard to keep that. Yeah. So it's very, very clever. Um, it's called homeostasis. Yeah. The homeostasis of the blood pH is in that range. And uh, yeah, we have many mechanisms to keep it there. So one, one of the influences is diet, but it's not the only one. And you mentioned at the start, yeah. you know, it's a controversial subject and there's different sides of the argument, but I don't see sides, I just see, hey, look for the balance, use it as a construct, <laughs> throw it into your dietary awareness and use it. Don't argue against it, yeah. just try and yeah. find the middle ground. I suppose the argument that I've seen is that some people say, okay, I'm eating an alkaline diet and um, Many of the ex experts say, in fact, one of the quotes is that there's no such thing, here's it, Jim, there's no such thing as an alkalizing diet. All foods, whether it be lettuce, fruit, steak, pie, whatever, will be met metabolized into acids. Therefore, all foods are acid forming, but pH is not regulated by diet. You know, I just feel that all foods contain acid and alkaline. It depends which is the predominant minerals in the actual food. Yeah. Ian, you touch on this in your book in that you say there's benefit to it or there is some merit in it and that with some patients, for example, someone that has gout, you may say, okay, an alkalizing <laughs> diet is better. But you go to fast oxidizers and slow oxidizers and that adds a completely different spin on, on, you know, on things. Tell us a little bit yeah, more about so that. Yeah, so what, what I like to do is, is just read, a, you know, I hate diet books, but I also like them because <laughs> every yep. diet book has a message that yep. I'll take and if it resonates, I'll use it. Yeah. So the metabolic typing is a dietary approach where it looks at fast, medium and slow oxidizers according to how we metabolize food. So, yep. you know, it'll affect whether we're big meat eaters or more plant based eaters. Um, with regards to a, a reference to a, a colleague in the UK who specializes in this approach and he said that some people need a more alkaline based diet i.e. higher vegetables um, and others uh, the fast oxidizers can can do with a less alkaline diet there you know when you do a pH um, measurement in the urine for example yeah. some people are actually center a little bit more acidic naturally yeah so I don't know how much truth there is in it but it makes a bit of logical yeah. sense um, and we ultimately we need to look at other health markers to understand full a person's full health. How do you test a person's metabolic typing? It's just a questionnaire. So it's metabolic typing is a book, um, and um, uh, Walcott and Walcott were the authors, and they've got an online questionnaire, okay. or you can take okay. out of the book. So it's just a questionnaire-based thing. Um, I have used it in the past. Um, I'll put a little bit of emphasis on it, but not too much. Because it just does shed just some light when you're not too sure. You know, you've tried something and it's, it's not working. Another argument that's come up is that your body's pH is going to be regulated and maintained irrespective of what you do, in that it wants to sort of maintain the state of homeostasis. So what we eat doesn't necessarily affect our blood pH. Debbie, is that yes. true? Yes, I'd love to elaborate okay. on that because there are certain buffer systems in the body. Um, the interesting thing is around urinary pH, yeah. and that's something that you can test with your traditional litmus type paper. And it's something that we encourage um, because you're going to see really what your body is dispelling, your metabolic and digestive sort of waste basket, if you will, yeah. um, comes through. And I think it's important to actually monitor that because that can determine really what type of foods you're eating and whether they're affecting your body. You can take that test literally every day, three times a day. And I encourage my clients to do the test so that we can actually check to see that it's around about 6.78 um, and, and that preferably in an alkaline position. Mm. If it's not, you are generally seeing that people are, are tending towards uh, acidic foods. Yeah. Now your blood is different. Your blood would never be affected by food. There are certain buffer systems, okay. right? Yeah. And it's fascinating because your yeah. body is on the struggle to constantly balance, Maintain. as I yeah. said. So, yeah. And your lymphatic system is very involved in this because you've got acids and your acid um, level influences the lymphatic system. So yeah. you've got to constantly 
get rid of this this um, acidity in your bloodstream, which then goes through the kidneys and the liver. So they're under pressure to actually um, dispel toxins and balance. Now, in terms of buffering, you have sort of a lymphatic system where if you don't have enough uh, minerals in your diet and you don't have enough calcium, you're gonna be compromised. Um, what happens is your body starts stealing from itself. Oh. So it starts stealing from the, the organs. Bones. Okay, so that's a very big point. Okay. The other thing is the, the fat. Um, the fat in your body, there's sort of a, a, a dispel type of situation, a fat buffering system. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And what happens is that the, the body actually is overloaded with toxins. Yeah. So the body cannot eliminate quickly enough. So what happens is eventually it will actually create um, a fat bound um, around the organics that are created by the body and that's going to store itself in a fat cell which then of course sits um, along the hips and it's those the areas and, and it links yeah. around yeah. obesity, the abdominal so uh, not yeah. very pleasant. But yeah. your body does balance itself. Yeah. Your your blood is always at a level where it's going to okay. uh, balance. So we've naturally. got that one to rest. I love that. That's okay. We're going to take a quick break. Um, but diet induced acidosis is this possible? It's something that's come up. We're going to ask our guests about it. So stay tuned if you want to find out more. I'm feeling better. Da, 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 da. If you've just tuned in, we're discussing the body's pH balance and the role it plays in our overall well-being. Um, one of the questions that came through, Deborah, and I think you've sort of touched on it, was all foods are acid-forming, but pH is not regulated by the diet. Virtually all pH is regulated by respiration or elimination by the kidneys. Um, what other factors affect pH in our body? There's so many um, reasons why a person becomes acidic. And it can involve things like lifestyle choices, the kind of foods we eat. You'll touch on that a lot in your books and try and educate people on that. The type of drinks we drink. And we're talking like not only alcohol, we're talking the type of water you drink, which is a great passion very, of very mine. Um, definitely the stresses in life. Yeah. How we actually cope with stress. I mean, everyone does stress, we know this. Yeah. But it's how you actually cope with the stress and how you handle it. Pollution absolutely massive. What we breathe, um, what we actually consume, um, it's so important. Yeah. And then um, maybe we can touch on sort of environmental type of pollutions. Um, it goes even further. And I Chemicals, don't know, did I leave anything else? Um, pesticides, yeah. um, Drugs. in our foods, um, type of medications, over yeah. supplementation, big thing. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, as a holistic um, program, you know that what, what we think, mm. what goes through yes. the gut is so important. Yeah. Um, you know, what through the, the gut is going to go through the brain, they're very linked. Mm. Your gut is your second brain, brain. and yes. your gut is your second immune system. Yep. So let's get to the root cause of the problem by treating the gut. So would, mm. is, I mean, if we're saying that the pH is regulated by respiration or elimination, are we saying that then this maintenance starts from the gut first? or would it be in the kidneys and in the lungs? Generally, I'll start first with the gut because it's the most, uh, the biggest influence you can have from a nutritional and a lifestyle and stress perspective. Yeah. So yeah, we're going beyond acid alkaline balance here. Um, and, and that's a good thing because it's not again, a simple dietary construct. Exactly. Eat more vegetables and less animal based yeah. or, or refined carbs. It's um, also to do with how well you're digesting. Is there inflammation going on in the gut, which has a big knock-on effect for the rest of the body, including these other organs, yeah. like liver and kidneys Get that effect. you mentioned? Is that not why some people think that eating more alkaline diet is better? Because in effect, what it's actually doing is reducing something like um, inflammation, for example. I, I, I like the acid alkaline approach as a construct of health. Yeah. Because just by looking at a simple, you know, alkaline farming versus acid farming food chart, you automatically get your uh, clients or people that you influence um, eating more vegetables yeah. and less of the, the processed food. So it's a very good construct. But yeah, the inflammatory aspect is really important yeah. because they go hand in hand. 
If I show you an acid alkaline chart with a pro versus anti-inflammatory chart, the foods in them are, are fairly mirror. So okay. to reduce inflammation in the body, you're generally getting more plant matter in, yes. um, more good oils and nuts and seeds in there, yeah. uh, and less of the refined and the man-made uh, products. So yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really useful construct. Of okay, we, we mentioned this earlier in one of our previous shows that um, people are just, I think they're taking their health into their own hands. I think they want to live mm. healthier lifestyles. They're researching mm. a little bit more. So when I put this up as a topic that we're going to be discussing, one of the, the, the questions was around the acid alkaline ash diet theory and that mm. when all foods are effectively, well, when, when they're metabolized, incinerated in our body, they mm. leave behind an ash and this ash can either be acid or alkaline. Yes, that's is really that what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a conversion and, and I touched on the whole buffer process. Now the body might use protein um, to actually, you know, create um, that balance in the body that yes. we spoke about that's so important in the blood. I honestly believe that the blood is the biggest part of acid alkaline balance. Um, and the other important thing is that your body, if it doesn't have enough minerals, your body will actually take calcium from the system if it doesn't have enough to in order to balance the um, acid balance or alkaline balance yeah. to cope and to have that measure yeah. and I think this is Im important um, more than anything. So the essentially ash diet, leaches it from your bones, is it, that what happens? Yes, it will. It pays um, a price. Only if you don't have enough in the body in terms of the supplementation and okay. the good alkaline foods that you're eating. Yeah. The only time that it will steal literally mm. from the bones and organs is if they are compromised and if they do, do not have enough oxygen in them. And I think that's also another interesting subject. Yes. Yeah. And you know, to talk about the ash diet and to argue a few um, of the different um, theories out there, I think is a little outside of the scope of this program and could probably be looked at at greater length um, later because it's so involved and so controversial but so fascinating. Yeah, look, these, mm. these are the questions that our viewers have been sending us, and it's nice. I know sometimes things do go out of the scope, but mm. it is what people are researching nowadays. Mm. And because you spoke about blood pH, I'm gonna ask um, the question from Adam. He says, urine pH is not a good indicator of the overall pH of the body. Is it though a good indicator of general health as it can be influenced by many factors other than diet and is one of the ways in which your body regulates pH anyway? I love that subject. Yeah. Um, I look at it at a little bit as your lymphatic system that is the cleaning house. If you think of your house, your body as a, as a house, your lymphatic system is the thing that cleans. Yeah. And the urinary pH is the thing that is the waste bin. And therein lies a lot of stories about your metabolic and digestive waste. And that's really the key of urine and perhaps even saliva pH and okay. it stops there. Okay. And what I want to say is uh, people always say if I eat oranges, lemons, are they not acidic? Yes. They are acidic to the taste but alkaline in the bloodstream because of the uh, acid ash. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, is it because, I was going to say, why is that? You know, Can lemon you on its own is acidic but you put it in water and it has an alkalizing effect on the body. Why is that? I, <laughs> I always encourage uh, my clients to drink uh, hot water with fresh lemon. Yes. You know, nothing processed, etc. And they feel much better. Yeah. They've got a sore tummy. Take some hot water with fresh lemon. Yeah. And it's not acid, it's very alkalinizing in the bloodstream. Well, it, it, it's actually helpful for stomach acidity because it's one of yes. my little manipulations I'll use to try and get somebody ready to digest a meal, either lemon juice or apple cider, cider vinegar. vinegar. But ultimately, when it gets translated into nutrition in the body, it becomes an alkaline influence. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting. So is it in the metabolism? Yes. That, yes. That's how. Okay. Um, what about dietary acidosis? Acidosis is really um, once again going back to the type of foods that we're eating. eating. We can influence the way our body reacts, um, and we can influence, in fact, many diseases in our food choices. Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah. that's really what the argument's about, yeah. um, um, acid and alkalinity is. Yeah. There certainly are foods that have been recognized as more alkali. And in the Journal of Public um, and Environmental Safety, in 2012, the volume, 
it has stated literally that the alkaline balance is absolutely essential Pivotal, in yeah. terms of your microorganism and your, and your cell integrity. It's so important to, to consider that this involves the type of foods that we eat and but, the type of minerals and vitamins that we're taking in. So something that's come up, and I'd love you guys to think about it, and we'll discuss it after the break, is do cancers and pathogens thrive in a more acidic environment, or is that actually not really true? So I'll let you guys mull over that for a short while. And uh, when we come back from the break, in fact, we'll discuss more foods that you should be eating, those that you should be avoiding, uh, that affect the acidity or alkalinity of your body. Stay with us. I'm feeling better. Da, 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 da. Ba, ba, da. You're watching Real Health and we're discussing acidity and alkalinity of the body and I, ask our, I asked our guests to think about this. I'm sure they already had the answers already, but do cancers and pathogens thrive in a more acidic environment? I would say yes, because remember that um, those cancer patients, if you find out what they're eating, they're really not eating enough fresh fruit and vegetables um, or they're having too much meat, a lot of dairy products. And what I've found is that a lot of people come to me as the last resort. <laughs> I can't tell you that. And uh, <laughs> they've been diagnosed as cancer many years ago, yeah. and the cancer's come back. Yeah. And the first question that I ask them is, what did you do about your lifestyle when you first were diagnosed? Yes. No, nothing, carried on just did the chemo, got better, felt great, and just carried on eating the way I was eating. Yeah. So how do you feel about that? Do we not have to change when these uh, illnesses manifest? Yeah, people have their heads stuck in the sand often. But I love to see, hear stories when people do really, they're facing death and they turn around their, yeah, yeah. their yeah. whole direction. But do you believe that, that cancers and pathogens thrive in an acidic environment? I've, I've read some, some research papers where cancers thrive in an alkaline environment and that's where we come, we're coming back to that balance again as well, Deb. Well, I, I've got a sort of take on the fact that the body is 75% predominantly water, water, depending on your age. So your potential of hydrogen and oxygen determines a little bit about this type of situation, okay. in my opinion, yeah. right? But if we have a look at the type of water, if we're drinking water that is highly acidic, these pathogens, these bacteria, these molds and these funguses, they're gonna thrive in that environment. And I think that's the relevance. Um, it's very hard to sort of define what happens with your cancers because you know there's, there is a situation where cancer is um, your T cell etc etc there's, there's so many sort of um, modalities that you can look at I believe that the way your body is designed structurally the biochemical reaction of the minerals in your body play a huge role in determining the waste and the acid leaving the body and what is in the body at the moment both in the cell and outside the cell yeah. so if you consider once yeah. again the fact yes. that water is predominantly 75 percent of the body it gives you some food for thought so if the acidity in our stomach is destroying pathogenic viruses and bacteria how can pathogens thrive in an acidic environment. Am some, I missing something here? No, <laughs> no, no if, not a, at all. if anything is acidic enough, it'll destroy everything. Okay. If anything's alkaline enough, it'll destroy anything. Think back to your chemistry days at school and yep. you get uh, strong hydrochloric acid. Yeah, it's just gonna demolish everything. So you're talking more about close to the neutral. You, you're deviating from the seven okay. down to a six, or so the seven up to an eight. And some pathogenic organisms will thrive in a slightly more acidic environment, some will thrive in a slightly more alkaline environment. So we haven't really touched on the fact yet that uh, we can over, over alkalinize ourselves. Well, I was going to go into that because that's what I found with my own health was um, I had struggled with eczema. Everyone that watches the show knows that story by now. And I thought I was more acidic. And at that point in time, I was eating meat. Um, I was taking certain green supplements as well. And when I went for my pH test, um, my, my naturopathic doctor said to me, well, actually, you're slightly more alkaline. And then when I started doing some research, I realized that 
vasoconstriction occurs when someone is in a more alkaline or too much of an alkaline state. Mm. And then he explained to me about blood circulation not going to my skin and other mm. soft tissues, and it actually started to make sense. Mm. So as Deb mentioned, as you just mentioned, that being on the, on the extreme end of either spectrum isn't good either. It's just like anything mm. in the body. Anything, yeah, yeah exactly. Balance. Mm. Did you feel tired when I at did. the same time? I did. Because one of the uh, side effects of uh, hyper, sorry, being too alkaline, yeah. is um, you don't ca the red blood cells don't carry oxygen as efficiently around the body. Ah. And therefore that's important for Would energy. Would that somehow then have been linked with the iron supplement because... Then you need stomach HCL. Well, yes, I was put on digestive mm -hmm. enzymes yes, with beaten... With stomach and yeah, hydrochloride. hydrochloride. Yeah. W what did you mean about iron? When you, when you speak about the hemoglobin, I know that yeah. hemoglobin action is, the, yeah, is yeah. affected by iron. Is that, would, would that have been a reason why I would have been put on a supplement? Possibly. Iron supplement. Iron. If you're tested no. low in yeah. um, some hemodynamics, yeah, you, yeah you, you might have been put on an iron yeah. supplement. But... Yeah, the dietary balance and your breathing mechanisms yes, as well, yes, it's really effective. important. There. Which is why we were saying stress um, affects your pH as well, because obviously when you're stressed, they say that most people um, employ shallow breathing as yes. opposed to deep breathing. Yes. Is that true? Well, I wonder if I could touch on the alkalosis situation. Yes. Right? I think one of the first signs that you can know whether you're perhaps a little bit higher than the 7.5 in, in the alkalinity level would be telltale signs in your body, okay. right? You've got eczema. Yeah. A lot of allergies occur, um, skin rashes. Your body is like really sensitized. Your nerve cells are very sensitized. You become nervous, that's the shallow breathing, and your body doesn't have as much oxygen. Yeah. Um, other things that happen when you suffer from alkalosis is you suffer from actual seizures. Um, these wow. are just trends that, wow. that are warning signs or telltale signs. I'm very interested in the dynamic of why when you're in a state of alkalosis that these seem to be some of the symptoms. What's happening chemically? What's, what's going on inside? If you can somehow try and summarize it for us, as opposed yeah. to if you're in a slightly acidic state. Well, I think sort of, once again, opinion based. Yeah. I'm very fascinated with mitochondrial injury okay. and very fascinated with um, enzyme uptake, right, which influences the mitochondria ultimately because that's the powerhouse of your cell. Um, and I was going to touch on one really, really important um, subject called reactive oxidative stress. And that's what happens. Your body is um, in a position where it's got free radicals and there are certain um, sort of, you know, your, your buff system. And once again, your body, mm. your body isn't able to actually fight off yeah. and oxidize those free radicals. And that's my take on it. I so think that's you, what happens. Yeah, when you mention this, is this not why diet or the supposed alkaline diet improves... Um, Balance? Yeah, it improves one moving towards at homeostasis because, for example, those alkalizing foods, aren't they high in antioxidants? So is that not the mechanism that's, that's occurring, that's improving the right. situation? Okay, this is interesting because, <laughs> a, a, again, it depends on your body. Yes. And it depends on your body's absorption of those nutrients okay. and those antioxidants. Okay. Right? Because you often have to be able to actually absorb because you could be taking in um, a lot of fruit and vegetables that have their antioxidants, yeah. but you might not be absorbing. And the Which assimilation is why, yeah, it says it into the, the, the your gut health. Yeah. 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 Because pH is determined um, intracellularly and extracellularly. So ah, you're talking about cells. Okay. And there are different mechanisms, both inside and outside the cell. Okay. And yeah. Um, the ketogenic diet. A lot of people talk about acidosis associated to the ketogenic diet. In order to get into a state of ketosis, it's very, very hard work. Yeah. And you need to come down to a very low carbohydrate intake. Yeah. Um, some people never get into it, but the old Atkins talked about uh, ketosis and now the banting's connected with ketosis. Um, it puts you into a fat burning dominant state because you've pretty much depleted your glycogen or your carb storage. Um, but is it linked to acidity? It's going to depend on the balance in your diet. So you've reduced down carbohydrate, which is potentially a good thing,
but you may have an overemphasis on your, your animal-based yeah. proteins, yeah. dairy products, uh, and you might not be getting enough of the fruit and veg, which is the balancer. So, you know, I quite like the paleo diet, yeah. uh, which is, it's not low carb, and it's got plenty of plant-based uh, material in it. And if you get that balance right for your health, yeah. and remember I said about different metabolic types earlier, um, for your metabolic type, if you're getting that pro animal versus pro yeah. protein balance correct, yeah. then you should ultimately get closer to the um, optimal pH. So I was interested in the ketogenic diet link because my sister was on the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. Yes, they used and so, that. Yeah. yeah, and when you mentioned the alkalosis and seizures, mm. you know, it sort of said, well, in, in my mind, I was like, well, is there well, something like ketogenic acidosis well, there? Well, that, that's more al al yeah. alkalosis yeah. that yeah. Deborah was talking yeah. about. So you're talking more about acidosis. On the, yes, on the other end of the um, spectrum. So that might be why they do it. Yeah. Um, with epilepsy, I've, I've always been aware of that research with the ketogenic diet, but I'm also aware of uh, research just regulating blood sugar levels, yes, yes. which makes sense. If you drop your carbs down low, you, you should have better blood sugar regulation, yeah. but you might not need to be quite so severe as to go into full ketosis. Okay. But the point is that uh, a lot of people on uh, Banting and Atkins, etc., might have a bit of a cheat now and again, and that takes them out, out of ketosis, ketosis. Mm. and it takes them five days to get back mm. into yeah. that burning Well, I mean, mode. something, um, Something Patrick Crawford was yes. mentioning was, yeah, yeah, it can take five days. It can be take two weeks to get into ketosis, but it takes five minutes, minutes to, to get, get out of it. To get out of it. So, you know, my own feeling is we've got two fuel sources, potentially three, because protein does contribute. Yeah. For a reason, and we've got the biomechanic, biochemical machinery in our body for a reason. Yeah. We, we don't want to just say, okay, sorry, carb metabolism, you can retire now. We're just going to focus on these other yeah. areas. Yeah, oh, so. and I know, I know it's about individuality because I mean, she she achieved um, successful reduction in in her seizures with a ketogenic diet. Mm. But again, that's because she was diagnosed with epilepsy, mm. and especially the type of epilepsy. But as you keep on mentioning, it's about what's good for you as an individual. So the origin of the word acid is the Latin word acidus, which means sour or tart. Think of the common tastes of acidic su substances such as vinegar, which contains acetic acid, or citric acid, which is found in grapefruits, oranges, lemons, and limes. Let's explore food a little bit more when we return. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. If you've just tuned into Real Health, we have a fascinating discussion underway. We're talking pH, and basically the acidity and alkalinity of all substances are expressed in terms of pH, which measures the concentration of hydrogen ions or potential hydrogen, hence pH. So Ian, we may not be able to conclusively say whether diet does affect it or doesn't, and we've said it's all about balance at the end of the day. So what type of foods would you be recommending people, including their diet, when they say, I want to correct my acidity or alkalinity. I think um, from a scientific perspective, you always get the, uh, the people sitting on, f on fences. Um, I think we've got enough information that yep. we can say, right, yep. our diet's going to It's going to benefit us. you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, on my more alkaline list would be uh, vegetables, plenty of greens, fruit, but moderation based on the blood sugar, because blood sugar dysregulation can influence potentially yeah. acidity. Yeah. Um, nuts and seeds will be kind of Ooh, mid middle. midway. Okay. But potentially some are a little bit more alkaline. I've okay. got I've got a nice handout that I get okay. to people. And then on the um, acidic farming side is um, y your meats and your dairies. Fish is kind of more towards the, the middle. Um, but then all your man-made stuff, that's the really high acidic farming, just like the high, uh, high inflammation farming foods, uh, your processed carbohydrates, your processed yeah. fats especially, oh, and um, saturated fats uh, can potentially push an acidic. I can hear someone saying, so if I'm in a state of alkalosis, shouldn't I be eating all of those foods? <laughs> and that's not the case, right? It's, they're still bad for you irrespective. So if someone is in that alkalosis, a state of alkalosis, what would they be including more of and maybe reducing? Okay, so, so 
yeah, they definitely man-made anything. You just get stay it out of your diet. From it. <laughs> but they might need to uh, add in a little bit more meat or uh, fish or um, okay. nuts or. Okay. Um, but they might need to reduce. They might be juicing like crazy yeah. every day, and they need to reduce the juices a bit. Um, but you can you can pick up in the urinary pH and and get a get a feel for where okay. they are. So this is where water comes in because a friend of mine gave me these five liter bottles of water. One had a pH of eight, another one of nine. Is that good? Very good. good. It is. Yeah, yes. It's called alkaline water. Um, if you take a look at labels, which I like that you did. Yeah. I think it's a good thing. Um, and you go and you buy water that is four and a half or below. Yeah. You are a thousand times more acidic than your blood, right? You have water that's a pH of five. You're a hundred times, or that is a hundred times more acidic than your blood. Now, if you're taking water in that's eight and above, it is slightly more alkaline than your blood, so it can only be good. Okay, yeah. it has, definitely has a different taste to it. Um, and, and I've heard some people say that they've had to get used to that taste. Yes. Just but, because but can you over alkalinize with the water? Yeah. Well, I think it's a, a restructuring, um, perhaps, depending on the, the water that you have. There's a lot of extra oxygen going in and potentially a lot of hydrogen, especially if you're going with mm. structured water, um, which is very new in South Africa. Yeah. And I think then, you know, it's all about once again, your body having enough hydrogen and oxygen, which is the basis. But I get what Ian is saying. So if someone is in a state of alkalosis, so me, for example, would the eight and nine water perhaps not be good for me, but maybe seven? Depends on how much you drink. Well, you know, if you, if you take that I should be drinking, say, say, let's say the two liters per day. And I know there's controversy around that yes. as well. Yes. I feel great when I drink between two and three, even though the recommendation for me and my body weight is 1.8, but I feel fantastic when I drink between two and three. So if I'm drinking between two and three liters of Alka. eight and nine alkaline water, is, is that not too alkaline? too alkaline for me? I Thoughts? think the yeah. important thing is um, balance once again. Yeah. Um, I think that someone who's in that kind of position is going to be working with a very well qualified practitioner yeah. and we have to respect their protocol. Two to three litres too much in my much opinion. Too much. I think that the biggest thing with alkaline water is literally the nutrient uptake. You're going to get better nutrient absorption of two to three litres of that, al of that alkalinity. But two to three liters of water is okay, or two to three liters of water is not good. Sorry, now depends I'm making on your body weight. Yeah. Also, see, this is this is the reason why yeah. I was asking is because I know that a lot of experts say it depends on your body weight, and I've only ever felt much better when I've had more water, even yeah. though I'm supposed to drink one the, point the, between one point six and one point eight. I, liters. I would agree. It's on the high side. Yes. Yeah. You probably aren't absorbing the water well enough. Okay. So some, yeah, some alkaline water or maybe some electrol electrolyte drops in your water mm. could be a benefit for absorption, but keeping an eye on your pH as well. Okay. And the trouble yeah. is a lot of people are not drinking enough water. Yeah. Water does so many things for the body besides hydration. Yeah. And uh, they don't like the taste of water. Yeah. Yeah. So I often say mm. put some lemon in the water. There is a product cucumber. on the market, oh. cucumber, yeah. that you can mm. put in some stevia or xylitol or there's a water mm. flavoring. I've seen those as well, yeah. Are you still getting the benefits if you start adding those no, type I've, of flavorings to it? I well, I think it depends on, water, on what it, it is. is. Yeah. Mm. Um, just remember the important thing is when your body's acidic, you're dehydrated. Yeah, yeah. It's a given. And the more you age, the more you dehydrate. Absolutely. Therefore, you become more acidic. Yeah. So hydration is very important for older generation. Yeah. Okay. Just, okay. Yeah. What about exercise? Very important. And affecting our... Fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> We've got two of these. Yeah. You can't exercise and have a bad diet. That's what I really maintain. Yeah. And you can't over-exercise either. Oh, yes, Because it's going to cause problems. Does it affect our acidity yeah. and our alkalinity, our pH levels? Yeah, sorry, I was yes, uh, disagreeing that you can't over-exercise, but yes, you can over-exercise. Yeah. So again, exercise, there's an inverted U. Yeah. Moderate is great, and moderate varies depending on the person. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it's... Uh, it's fundamentally good for inflammation. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a balancer. It's good stress. for lymphatic flow. It's good for balancing your stress hormones. Yeah. 
invigorating your thyroid gland as long as you don't do too much of it. Uh, yeah, it's a fundamental. Because then it starts having the opposite mm. effect. We were designed yeah. to move. Yeah. And what a, yeah, it what also about helps body fat. Yes, of body your composition. Fat. Yeah. Yeah. What about? Um, we've seen we see them in when we walk into any um, health store or pharmacy, base powders. You know, and there's a variety of brands. Is that something that works? You know, we, it's been touted as if you're too acidic, you need to be supplementing with base powders. Someone who's fascinated and interested in supplements, I honestly believe that a lot of those base powders might have your bicarbonates, which is very important for alkalinity. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have mineral salts in there. Yeah. You need alkaline salt minerals because when you're acidic, your body is going to search for them, and if it doesn't find them, it's going to steal from the body. Yeah. So that's important. Are they um, calcium based as well? Some of them. Very important to be yeah. calcium based. Yeah. Magnesium I'm sure. and sodium, potassium. Sodium, magnesium, potassium. Those are, are really the elements that you're going to need to keep your body alkaline. And they're your electrolyte minerals. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I believe you can overdo the base powders. Yeah. Uh, you can push yourself into an over alkaline state, or you can take it at the wrong time of the day and uh, neutralize your stomach acid. Um, that's one of my tests is to take a teaspoon of bicarb to see how much you burp, you know, to yes. see how much stomach acid you have in, in there. So if so you burp more, you have more acid. More acid, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're reacting you to the bicarb. Okay. Yeah. okay. So yeah, I think you can overdo it, but uh, it's definitely a very useful manipulation to get somebody more rapidly yeah. into a yeah. more alkaline state. Okay. I just want to add it's all very well taking that, but you also have to change your way of eating. Yes. Of That's course, very yeah, important. yeah. There's no, there's no um, use One in, only. yeah, in supplementing a poor diet. Yes. In other words, well, remember that sleep and meditation can also go a long way in assisting your body to restore equilibrium. After the break, our experts share their personal tips to ensure that we maintain the body's optimal pH levels. Do stay with us. I'm feeling better. You've been watching Real Health and we've explored the topic of pH levels. Remember, your bowels and your skin should be slightly acidic. This helps keep unfriendly bacteria away. Meanwhile, saliva is a little bit more alkaline and your urine is normally more acidic, especially in the morning. Well, your body also regula regularly deals with naturally occurring acids that are the byproducts of respiration, metabolism, cellular breakdown, and even exercise. So at the end of the day, the goal is not to think of acid as bad and alkaline as good. It's all about balance, and that's what our guests have told us, essentially. Um, but I mean, just your final closing thoughts, guys. I mean, we, we spoke about sleep and meditation. Something that has helped me a lot is learning to meditate, learning to just take that time out, settle my mind, which effectively settles my body as well. And I started at three minutes a day, and then it moved to five minutes a day. And this is effective, eh, Ian? That's all you need. Yeah. There's a big blockage around meditation, yeah. so I usually reframe it into a breathing exercise. Yes, that's a good <laughs> uh, one. <laughs> three minutes a day, okay, it's doable. Yeah. So yeah, a really good contribution. Um, but when you're in a meditative state, you naturally expand down and open the diaphragm. And, that, and that's the key to good breathing. But through the whole day, you ideally want to be doing that yes. as well. Yes. So good breathing is important. And we haven't even talked about breathing yet, but it has a very strong influence on the acid alkaline balance. If we're over, if we're maybe shallow breathing, yeah. but over breathing, we actually push ourselves into a hyperalkaline state. If we're mm. under breathing, then we push ourselves into an acidic state. So the breathing is fundamental. And, and I've got a very detailed article in, in my magazine from the, the UK that. Um, it's just about breathing yeah. and the complexities of it. Yeah. So it's very complex, but the fundamental is you need to move that diaphragm. Yeah. And every, t every time the diaphragm moves, it stimulates the vagal nerve, okay. oh, wow, which I is our relax yeah. and repair yeah. nervous system. Which so goes straight into your gut as well. Yeah, and that's where the biggest that gut influence feeling. on the gut. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Sleep, I think, is very, very important. The best sleep is before 12. And so many people go to bed much later. They do mm. wake up earlier. Mm. But are they getting the best sleep? I think sleep is very important. Sleep About quality. seven hours yeah. um, a night is very, very important. Yeah. You can catch up a bit on the sleep over the weekends. But I think the most important thing really is to switch off the computers yeah. and the television. 
and use no television in the bedroom. It's just got to be for sleeping. And the mm. cell phones. Cell phones. Yeah, are that light. Many people have it right by their, no, you're their right. head and yeah, like you're right. talking it's the to the cell phone tower. Mm. Yeah, you're teenagers right. Teenagers sleep with their phones. Wow, uh, yeah, that's, that's very true. Yeah, <laughs> I have it right by my bed, and that's I'm saying I'm guilty of that. You wanted to touch a little bit on humic acid. Tell us a little, little yes. bit about that. What is it? Well, it's something I'd love to share with you and the viewers. I think yeah. it's important that we know, firstly, in terms of alkalinity and acidity, it's actually your body that's going to readapt and heal itself. Mm. Um, there are certain things that you can take. There's certain foods that you can eat and lifestyle influences like grounding, which I'm very familiar with. Yes. Right. Um, but there are certain things in what I call God's pharmacy, right? These are natural organic minerals. And there's a concept that I've been working on in healing my own body uh, for the last 10 years and working and researching with this. And it's called humic substance substances. <laughs> Don't worry, I've had right. one of those days as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we are talking about humic and fulvic acid, right? And these are components and molecules that can help your body actually balance naturally. Okay. What I like about it is when we're talking about this whole process of buffering, yeah. the humic substances have a buffering consequence. Um, they have an electron ability and an accepted donor within the cell. So it's very interesting yeah. because when you are absorbing minerals um, and your body is balancing, you need to know, are you going to accept those minerals or are you going to reject? Your cells have to make those decisions. But in the presence of fulvic acid and humic acid substances, that can happen. Hmm. So yeah, very interesting and wonderful. See, my brain is working now because Ingredient. insulin resistance is the cell not being receptive to insulin. Mm. So I'm wondering, would it have an impact on that as well? Absolutely. And I, I just encourage people just to do some Google research, mm. type in the name humic substances, fulvic or humic acid. And um, obviously, um, our names are on, on at the end of the show, and yeah. anyone can contact are me. Are you guys blogging, like, for example, some of the references you mentioned, is that available on your website and the articles that, that you've referenced? Or um, yeah, if can you, people just get in contact with you? And uh, obviously, obviously, my book, yeah, your book um, yeah, is, yeah. has got a lot of information, but uh, myself and Rachel have started blogging okay, once a week. Okay. And we have it on our Facebook page as well. So, awesome. yeah, there, there's a building collection of uh, material yes. on the website. Yeah. That, no, that's awesome because that's mm, the absolutely. type of information that people are looking for as yes. well. But, guys, thanks so much for coming in and Thank chatting to me about us. it. I mean, I know that we can l discuss a little bit more and we've opened mm. up some subtopics that we can go into as well. So, we'll definitely bring you back yes. for that. But I think we've looked at pH levels from a different light and that's exciting as mm. well. And we've informed and empowered people as well. So thank you again for coming on to Real Health. Do you believe that the body's pH really does have an impact on our overall well-being? Why not share your thoughts and your testimonials with us? Please send me an email to info at thehomechannel.co.za. Also, you want to get in touch with any of our guests on today's show, you can visit thehomechannel.co.za for more details. Until next time, goodbye, stay healthy, and remember our health mantra, you're healthy, vibrant, and lean. Love and take care of your beings. Cheers. Better now, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better.